Hey, what's up, it's Aaron, and welcome back to the Cash PT Lunch Hour Podcast. Uh, today is a special episode. A few months ago, I was a guest on Bedros Koulian's Empire Podcast. Bedros is one of my mentors and business coaches. Been working with him going on four years, and we were we sat down at his studio out in California and recorded an episode on the big conversions you need in your business. So a couple of things we, we're gonna talk about today is why I dropped everything to become a professional cyclist. We're gonna talk about a little bit about my journey, but really we're gonna dive deep in some strategy on direct response marketing, what it is, how we use it to um, kind of annihilate our competition. We're gonna talk about the high converting webinars and conversions you need in your business to grow your business and succeed in 2022 and beyond. So I uh, hope you enjoy this episode. I know um, I got a ton out of being there and we've got so much great feedback from uh, Bedros' audience that I wanted to make sure that we shared this with our audience. Um, so enjoy and when you're done, um, a couple things I would love for you to do is um, send me a message or even shout out uh, your top insights or what you learned in the Instagram story and two, look out for information about PT BizCon because Bedros is a speaker at PT BizCon, which is coming up this spring. And if you would like to you know, get a chance to meet with us, uh, hear Bedros speak, hear me speak with, um, along with uh, I don't know, about uh, a dozen special guests and hundreds of other physical therapists and B PT business owners just like you, all together um, to learn and grow your business and take your business to um, new heights uh, so that uh, you can go all in on your business and get everything out of it that you ever imagined, you're gonna wanna join us at PT BizCon. Bedros has spoken there for the last few years, so he'll be there again this year. And uh, I look forward to seeing you at the event, but most importantly, hearing your insights and takeaways uh, from an another amazing and special episode of the Cash PT Lunch Hour podcast. Talk soon. And here, let's just get into the episode now. This strive for perfection is, if we're an entrepreneur, it's just gonna kill us. It's gonna keep us down. We'll feel bad about ourselves, depressed. Like, why can't I get this done? Well, it is done. What's happening, friends? Welcome to another Empire Show. My name is Bedros Koulian, and that is not Craig Ballantyne because this is an inside look, and that is Aaron LeBauer. Uh, four years now going on as a coaching client. Yeah, man. Uh, thanks for coming in. Um, and Aaron is a physical therapist who focuses on cash practice, so you don't yep. necessarily have to deal with all the bullshit that insurance companies and mm -hmm. all those things focus on. And so it doesn't matter if you're a physical therapist, a personal trainer, an online business, an offline business owner, the thing we're going to talk about with Aaron today that he's been doing really well in the last 12 years, and I've had the good fortune to coach him over the last four years, is really creating funnels that lead to webinars that convert. And you sold masterminds, courses, seats to live events, yep. um, right? Uh, a um, subscription to a uh email uh, yeah. software. Software, subscription <laughs> software. So um, sit back, relax, folks. If you've got a business and you want to be able to use online funnels and webinars specifically to be able to sell and convert leads and prospects into paying clients and customers, you're in for a fun ride. Uh, but before we dive into the actual education part, um, dude, you were telling me before we cameras went live that some stuff I didn't know about you. It's funny because whenever we meet up, whether it's for the half days or we do our monthly coaching calls, yeah. we just dive right into business. And I was like, oh shoot, I didn't know that about Aaron. And one of the only times I would have probably gotten to know that from you would have been when I was supposed to come out and speak at your event because mm -hmm. you know, good opportunity to hobnob. And of course, COVID fucked that up. Um, but <laughs> you were supposed to be a pro or you dropped everything in yep. life to be a pro cyclist. Tell us more about that. Yeah, I think um, back in, uh, from 97 to 2004, pretty much all I did was race and train bikes or find ways to- like road bikes, right? Road bicycles, yeah. um, so that I could have enough money to do that. And I lived in one of the most expensive cities in America, in San Francisco, but it Shoot. had, it was the, for amateur cycling, it was one of the top regions in the nation for amateur cycling. Is it because of the hills or? For the, for the hills, the numbers of people there, 
the, we could race Friday and Saturday. We could do a training race on Tuesday and Thursday, and I could go down to the track in San Jose on Wednesday and Friday night. So I could race five or six days a week if Damn. I wanted to in the summer. Nice. And um, I started racing when I was younger because my younger brother did it. And I couldn't let him be better than me at anything. Right. And uh, as I got older, I moved out to California and I couldn't do it. I had to get a job and it sucked and I could not do it. So I went and uh, I was on 43 Embarcadero one day. I was working as a temp and I'd already graduated college and they treated me like I didn't know the alphabet. And I'm sitting there looking down at all the bike messengers and I was like, man, I should be doing that. And I, I went and signed up and became a bike messenger. So I got paid to ride bikes, but yeah. I still couldn't race. And racing for me was all about how could I push my body as hard and as far as possible. And um, I got to a point where, um, I mean, I raced in Europe for a summer. I raced in Belgium and uh, our team went pro, but I didn't go pro. That's the part I want to know more yep. about because you were also the best rider on the team. Yep. So I was uh, the best rider. And up to that point, I had um, in, in amateur cycling, there five is where you start and category one is basically a pro without a contract and i was a category one everyone else on my team was a category two or lower and i had helped all those guys get their upgrades so we could turn pro but up until that point i had been the one getting all the sponsorship contracts and putting the team together and i said i can't do this anymore i need to focus on training and push it over to these other guys they brought in a um a sponsor and they turned pro, but they didn't even, I went to training camp and everything, but they didn't tell me I wasn't on the team. Huh. And um, yeah, it was, uh, it was kind of fucked up where I was the best rider on the team, but they brought in three guys who were, had been pros already. And at the, once you're in the pro, in the league, there's, everyone's a pro. We weren't going to the tour, but our team, you could have 60% of the guys had to be under age 26. I was 27 or 28. So I was older. But the three guys they brought in were over 30. They had already been pros. One um, got kicked off the team halfway through the year. One tested positive in the spring and uh, for like testosterone from the year before. And they never brought me up. And I quit after that because I was like, did, did I'm not you ever doing figure out else. why you weren't made part of the team? Like what happened? I don't know. I think the the sponsor was like, hey, Aaron, when you get your upgrade in Category 1, we're bringing you in the pro team. And I was like, wait a minute. I've been Category 1 for a couple of years. Like, right. what's happening? And I think there was some interpersonal relationship. I think it was just like, you know, I don't know. The, they could bring the younger guys in, and they brought in these older guys, and there was Aaron in the middle, and there was no loyalty anymore. Yeah. Okay. And, huh. you know, I think that's what happened. I got my, and they were like, Aaron, where's your new bike? And I was like, well, y'all haven't sent me the wheels. I don't have the wheels and the other parts that I was used to getting for free. And they, like, now I have to pay for these parts and they're not in. And May came around. I mean, there was other stuff. Like, we go traveling around um, the East Coast. And the guys on the same team were not interested in helping me, like, having me share hotels with them or meals. But then a guy from another team was like, yeah, dude, come stay with me. Strange. And, um, yeah, and then they'd get into, uh, in the race and they'd work against me, even though we were wearing the same your like uniform in Jersey. Yeah. And we'd get out into a break, had a great chance of uh, getting ahead. And there was one of the guys from the pro team sitting on and they're like, Aaron, why are you doing? I'm like, I'm not on their team. <laughs> but they, it was really, um, mm. that was crazy. So, but, so there was obviously some kind of team. Yeah. Internal there was conflict some in, dynamic. Whatever. Yeah. Well, here, here's a fun fact for you. Yeah. I, uh, I did one road bike. I have, I've had one road bike experience and, uh, I look spectacular in the Jersey. I got to tell you that. Yeah. And, um, just spectacular. Somewhere around here, there's a picture floating around of me in a road bike jersey, and I wasn't wearing the shirt underneath, so my the the, the nipples were hiding right behind the the little tank top thing of my jig. Yeah. The bib top. Yeah. Uh, but I realized after doing 20 miles, we did a 20 mile ride. I was like, mm, this is good, but it's not for yeah. me. And yeah. uh, that that's that's cool. But I have so much respect for anyone who's at the top of their game. Yeah. Um, great lesson for everyone watching and listening to this episode: being competitive. Yeah. is a good thing. Like, if you want to know, like, do I have what it takes to be an entrepreneur who's successful? Let me ask you this. Are you competitive? Because I've known this guy in the entrepreneurial world, and I know you're highly, highly competitive. And it's like, oh, surprise, surprise. He was very competitive yeah. and at the top of his game at that. And I bet you if you take on a new hobby, if it's underwater basket weaving, I bet you'll be competitive <laughs> at that too. That's how I am. That's yeah. how the top people in every industry are. So Absolutely. if you're not competitive, um, big, big, you know, aha moment there, light bulb moment. 
You might want to be an intrapreneur where you go find someone that you like and you respect and you, you, you admire the business that they have and work within their business instead of trying to kind of putz along and, you know, kind of half-heartedly breaking even as an entrepreneur. Um, because as much as our job here on the show is to help people become entrepreneurs, it's also our job to tell people who maybe don't belong in the entrepreneurial space, like, hey, it's nothing but respect if you want to go and you know, be a second or third or fourth in command for someone, mm -hmm. you know, like we all need that. Yeah. Right. And so uh, to that point, it was kind of shift, shift gears. Um, again, over the last four years that we've been working together, your business has continued to grow. And even during COVID where <laughs> physical therapists were made to shut down, just like gyms were and restaurants right. were like you continued to grow. So, um, and the stuff you're about to share is pretty universal across all types of industries and brands. But let's just talk about this for a moment. Like, for one, why did you get into physical therapy? I mean, I, okay, I see like sports, athletics, mm -hmm. okay, riding a road bike, and so certainly working with the body, but why physical therapy? Yeah, so I had one of those, when I was working as a bike messenger, I came home and we'd probably I'd ride for eight hours a day and I'm taking the shower and I had this aha moment. So after, pretty much I, I do my best thinking when I'm working out or exercising or like in the shower right yeah. after. And I was like, oh, I can be a massage therapist and work four, four hours a day and race my bike. You know, it was like, boom. I was like, yeah, I'm going to do this. And I went to massage therapy school out in, uh, in Emeryville. Well, we're here in California. I'm like out in California. Yeah, we're yeah, here in California. Yeah, here in California. And um, I did that for a few years. And people were like, Aaron, man, you know, I've been to see um, chiropractors, physical therapists, orthopedic surgeons. I've seen all the massage therapists. You're the first person to touch me where I'm hurt. You're the first person to um, actually help me. And, and all I was doing was talking to them and listening to them and touch their body and, and do some massage and some um, other techniques, some myofascial release. And I got to a point where people were asking me, well, when am I going to get better? And I didn't really know. And I wasn't doing like a spa massage, more of a sports or like a focused therapeutic massage. And my wife encouraged me to go back to PT school. And I realized that um, PT school was going to give me a few things. It was going to give me the ability to help people understand when they were going to get better, just that next level of knowledge, because massage is more, um, you feel good, like let's just, it's a wellness thing versus yeah. like injury rehab. But it also allow me to call myself Dr. LeBauer. And when I can say, my name is Dr. LeBauer, people, like there's another level of respect. And so when I look back at it, I paid to have um, a DR and a period in front of my name, plus the ability to um, do some more advanced techniques with people like um, dry needling manipulation and um, help them understand, here's the length of the process this is gonna take. It's not a quick fix and it's not an open-ended. Yeah, um, yeah. Um, yet another lesson, sometimes uh, we pay. Yeah to become celebrities, we pay to gain authority, we can't pay to gain respect because all those things really help differentiate us from mm -hmm. our competitors. And so, you know, I know you kind of jokingly said, well, I kind of paid to get a DR and a period after my name to call myself yep. Dr. LeBauer. Uh, but also that, that, that is a point of differentiation. It separates yes. you from others who are doing what you were doing. And so as a physical therapist, obviously you were good at what you did and you kind of change, shift to cash practice um, I, th I don't think we need to dive deep into why you would, you know, move away from dealing with all the bullshit that insurance right. companies bring. But how do you realize, like, hey, I think I'm meant to help other physical therapists. I'm meant to coach other physical therapists. Yeah, I that came to me one day where basically I was just helping other people do what I was doing, and I had a, two experiences. Um, one, uh, two classmates asked me, hey, Aaron, how'd you get this business going? And I, I helped them. And I said to my wife, I said, my wife, Andra, and I said, you know, I helped them. They didn't even send me a thank you. She said, don't give when you expect something in return. Mm. I was like, oh, yeah, you're right. Very you wise know? woman. <laughs> she yeah. is. And then like the next week I had a woman who I'd had a, asked uh, for a phone call and I got on the phone and I was telling her some of the same things. And she said, well, how much do I owe you? And I was like, owe me? Like, what do you mean, how much do I owe you? She's like, yeah, I, I, this is valuable. I want to pay you for it. And I said, I don't know. She said, well, how much are you charging your patients? And so I told her, she said, I'll pay you that. And I said, like, okay, great. And that was the day I realized that what I was doing was something people valued. And, and then, um, and so I just sat down and said, here's what I charge for consulting. And so it wasn't planned, but what it was, what I was doing was sharing what I know. I wasn't holding it to myself. I was trying to help other people because I found a path to freedom for myself and my family, and I just wanted to help other people get it, and that turned into um, a coaching business. Yeah. yeah, and a coaching business has done really well. 
for you and your family, and a coaching business that can be replicated in any industry, not mm -hmm. just physical therapy. Yep. Uh, the practices that you use, uh, as people may or may not know the term direct response marketing, mm -hmm. um, sells software, it sells supplements, it sells coaching in every industry, it sells real estate, it sells medical services. Um, and so let's dive deep into that. Who were some of your early kind of maybe mentors that you learned from yeah. in terms of direct response? Um, the very first marketing book I got was J. Conrad Levinson's Guerrilla Marketing. Mm -hmm. and I know it's been revised now, but this was before you had an internet website. It was like the internet in San Francisco was just a business card web page. And I got this book and that was incredible. I pretty much tried to do everything he said. A lot of stuff didn't work. Um, and then one of the other uh, early um, mentors I had was you, but you've, I've told you this before, but mm -hmm. I stumbled across um, your website because when I started my physical therapy practice, I was looking up physical therapy marketing and I think I put in PT marketing yeah. and I ended up on your website. Can I tell you how many personal <laughs> physical therapists I've gained as customers, clients, coaching clients even, because of that very yeah. search, PT marketing, yeah. personal trainer, physical therapist. Yeah. And I landed on your blog post about how to get uh, ranked at the top of Google and here's the things to do, write the articles, do the YouTube things and all this stuff and I just did it. And all of a sudden within a few weeks, it was, it was um, like a game changer for me. And uh, that's how I ended up at Fit, uh, Fitness Business Summit in 2018 because right. I was showing a friend. I was like, you got to check out this website. This is the blog post that I you know, did. And then you started pixeling me and, I'll, and I ended up at um, FBS and a coaching client. But um, some of the other, um, I mean, Dan Kennedy, I've read yeah. a good chunk of his books. Um, and the whole idea was trying to figure out how do I, I had an ad in a local health magazine and it wasn't working. I was like, well, how do I get this thing to work? And I was just trying to figure out that, and that's when the direct, whole direct response um, piece came. But I had an early coach who taught us some of this, um, Scott. He was another body worker, and he helped me get my um, business in North Carolina off the ground, my massage business. Um, but it was just little pieces here mm -hmm. with an ebook, and I just like, this works so good. I gotta figure out how to do this better. So let, let, let's unpack direct response marketing, because the, the funnel that you went down, I think is really, Still works, by the way. Still effective, yeah. uh, and and as you as you kind of now explain the more elite version of doing that, I think it's cool for people to realize. So first, Aaron does a kind of a Google search, like PT marketing, mm -hmm. right? And you're kind of thinking like physical therapist marketing. Right. But I did marketing at the time, taught marketing for personal trainers, gym owners, and so you stumble upon a blog. So at the first, there was a need, yeah. right? Like you had this need, so. Guys and gals, if you're watching and listening to this episode, you know, when you're going to grow a business, identify like, is there a need for this? If so, then you become the solution. So I knew there was a need for personal trainers and obviously physical therapists. And in hindsight, I realized all businesses to rank <laughs> high for whatever key terms on Google that yeah. they want to rank for. And so, you know, there was a need. You did the search and you found the blog. The blog didn't say, um, give me your name and email address first, and then I'll mm -hmm. give you something. It didn't say buy anything. It just said, hey, here's a free strategy. It was a, I remember the blog post, I remember writing it. Here's a free strategy on how you can rank at the top of Google for keywords that people search. And so that's the whole idea there is kind of giving without expectation, yeah. Yeah. right? Coming with a giving hand. And if it works, then you go, well, holy shit, if this guy's free stuff is this valuable, what could the paid stuff be? And of course, he, you know, kind of used an industry term. He goes, oh, and then you had pixeled me. And so pixel means he hit my blog, he got the free value, and he deployed the free value and got results from it. So he's like, oh, maybe Bedros does know what he's talking about. Pixeling is obviously some of you know, some don't. A little cookie is placed on his, on his computer, on his device, and now I could chase him on Facebook and use Facebook marketing to go, hey man, I'm having an event and marketing someone who's very specifically using my content already. So to him, it's valuable. I'm having an event, come to it. And I remember we were kind of leaning over a cocktail table. Mm -hmm. uh, this might've been like the meet and greet time or yep, something. It was a VIP meet and greet. VIP yeah. meet and greet. We're leaning over a cocktail table and you're like, I'm a PT. And I was, in the back of my mind, I'm like, is it the wrong event? <laughs> and then as you explained, I was like, this, this makes sense. And so that strategy of figuring if someone's got a need, solving that need without asking for anything in return, and having that 
solve that solution be so good that they come back for more and ultimately become a client. We have, uh, I'd say, a friendship and a you know, client-coach relationship since. And to see you thrive has just been an absolute pleasure. And so, but you've taken what I've done and you've kind of 2.0'd it now with these webinar funnels. Mm -hmm. And so let's do a deep dive into that. Let's say someone's got a course that they want to sell. Yeah. Kind of walk us through this process. Yeah, so if you have a course that already sells, like it, you know it sells, then running a webinar is a great way to sell it. Because and, the sales site yep. has to convert yes. before you run a webinar. Yep, yep. Why, Even, is that, why is that? Because you can spend, hour, I mean, hours or tens of thousands of dollars building out an amazing product and course and no one wants to buy it. Bingo. Right? Yeah. Because you build it, f it from your perspective, not yeah. from your client's perspective. Yeah. So if you, have a, if you have a product or course that converts, webinars are amazing. I've sold um, you know, I, I, you know, $300 products, $2,000 products, um, $18,000 coaching from yeah. webinars. Have you ever added up how much you've sold from like webinar funnels total? Like if, or if you were to guess? <sighs> well, I mean... Millions. I millions. don't know. Like yeah. I got a two comma club award for one funnel and it's through uh, the freebie to the webinar to the coaching programs. Yeah. So um, it's a lot. I haven't. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know. Good problem to have. Yeah. Good. Great. Yeah. Great problem to have. Um, but so if you let's say you have a product that converts. Mm -hmm. okay, the way to think about a webinar is there's um, it's an online meeting. Uh, generally a one-way meeting, not like a Zoom conferencing type of thing. And you want to start with, what's the offer? So I have the offer converts. Okay, great. Now I can turn that into webinar slides. Then I want to unpack the offer. So do you take your sales site and you turn your sales site into slides that you show on a webinar? You almost could, but not really. Okay. It's very different than that. So, but I want to look at, with, from the sales site, I can really take the offer and turn that into one or two slides, my stack. Mm -hmm. So I have the primary offer plus the bonuses, the limited time bonus, and then the thing that you can only get now today on the webinar. These are already included in the course, but I am, it's, you know, it's called the, what is it, like value stacking, mm -hmm. right? So I'm gonna take out all the pieces and tell you what you're gonna get, what it's gonna do for you, and put a value by it. Now I, that's, I'm gonna work backwards. A lot of the things that I do, I work with the goal in mind, and I work backwards and try to figure out how do I get there. So how do I get someone to that offer? Well, I have to give them something first. Not only do I have to give them um, a training, I have to actually give them knowledge, hope, and uh, the vision that they can do this themselves. And I do that by talking about um, three different points. Let's say my, pro my product solves nine, nine, there's nine pieces to what it solves, like nine modules or six modules. I'm not gonna teach how to do it, I'm gonna teach people what they need to do um, I'm going to look at the objection, like the personal objection, okay, I can't do it, okay, I'm a physical therapist, I just graduated from school, I can't open up a, a business because I need an arbitrary five years. So I'm going to knock out the objection of the internal objection, the external objection, no one's going to pay more than a copay for physical therapy, and I need to um, get people to buy into the vehicle or the um, solution which is my course, but before I even introduce it. So I need to teach around those three things and show, so I teach um, three like secrets to launching a cash practice, three secrets to starting your business online and making money in 30 days. And each one has a story or testimony of someone who's been successful doing it. And then I've got, that's the core of the webinar. There's a transition between the core and the offer. And before the core, there's the introduction. Why am I the authority to teach this? Um, and, and I have to, at that point, also pre-frame the sale at the end. Mm. And that's how you build out a webinar, and, or that's how I do it. So those case studies that you're using, the examples of you know, customers and clients mm -hmm. that you're using are there to overcome internal and external objections that somebody watching the webinar yes. is gonna have, yes. right? Because there's no point in saying, hey, here's the offer, because if you just present the offer, they're going to go, well, wait a minute, dude, I can't do this. I can't afford this. I haven't been in business for five mm -hmm. years. Like you said, five years, three years, four years. It's such yeah. an arbitrary number that people just put on there. Like, <laughs> I'm not an expert until what, like, what happens on you it's wake up a excuse. certain day it's, and you're I'm laughing because so I hear it all weird. the time. Yeah. And by using actual humans who you can tell a story by yeah. or of, 
now they go, oh, well, I could relate to that. Yeah, yeah I had that same misconception as well, and I realize it's a false belief. Mm -hmm. And so you're really chipping yeah. away at objections before making that offer. Yep. The offer always comes with freebies that are just this like immaculate, you know, bonuses, right? Right. That kind of really stack the value. Yeah. Yeah. What are some really good freebies or value bonus offers that you've made that you're like, holy shit, that, yeah. that was that closed deals? Yeah. Um, it's the tangible digital download. So if I have a course and it's information, I need to have something tangible. I've realized I need to have something tangible for people. So when the very first product that I came up with was a toolkit. It was a just a 34 digital download of a of Word and PDF and doc files that I was already using for my business. I put them in. I called it the Cash PT Toolkit, or like for the Cash Practice Toolkit. And that was the very first thing I made, but that I knew at the time that this was the bonus because it's the thing that's going to help people utilize the information faster. The other one is um, another webinar I did for the course I did to make online money online 30 days, we had a one-click upsell of uh, a bunch of Canva templates. These are social media templates. And I had made this for my coaching clients as like a 2020 special gift. Like, let me show you some value for sticking with me. Right. And they were like, eh, whatever. I did this webinar and I put it in as a one-click upsell and it converted like 40% for a $97 one-click up. So I didn't even talk about it in the webinar. How about that? So you already yeah. made something that you gave away as a gift, yep. and then you repurposed it as a one-click upsell. In other words, that wasn't even the main course that you're selling. Right. It was a, hey, give me additional $97 for this thing that I've already made and gifted. Yeah, yeah. Beautiful. And 40% take rate. Yes, yeah. Just want to make sure people are like, was that a typo? No, yeah. that's 40% take rate. Like, I remember seeing the stats. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It was nuts. And it's because it's because it's the internet, right? I can't walk out with something I hold. When I come into your store or like, I, let's say I go into a Fit Body Boot Camp, I might be able to walk out with like some supplements in my hands or mm -hmm. uh, something like a, a band to do it or something like that. I can walk out with those things and I can touch it and I feel it. So for on the internet, it's the digital download, the thing I can put on my computer that gives us that same kind of feeling. And that's one of the best um, like uh, bonuses. And then the other bonus is the training that they need to... Um, conquer the big objection, but that's not included in the main training. So for, for my business, it's the, do you take my insurance training? So the course teaches you how to start a business. It teaches you how to, the legal parts of the business, the marketing, but I took out this one training and I offered it as a bonus because that's the number one objection all of our clients have where people go, well, we'll, pay, well patients pay if we don't take their insurance. So this training, it's a 40 minute training I did with one of my employees. I recorded it and repurposed it as a bonus. And the way I position is, if this training gives, gets you just one more new patient at a value of $1,500, then it's worth it. So now that training is now worth more than the course. Mm. So it's that, that's this limited, one of the limited time bonuses. So I've, I've do that and I find that uh, just by by focusing on what's the biggest problem that they have or that their patients are going to have and how do I um, conquer the objection and put giving them something that they feel like is something they would never know how to answer or do themselves, that becomes more valuable than anything else. So as you're doing the webinar, is there a process to open the webinar? Let's say mm -hmm. we'll get to the closing and the offer, but how do you open up a webinar? Is there some kind of like, you know, icebreakers you use? Yeah. Or so, walk, walk us through that. Yeah, what I do is um, I use a software called Webinar Jam. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of different softwares to do this. Um, but it allows me to put a little um, message, a sticky message at the top that says, hey, we'll be starting soon. Um, comment below if you can hear me and let us know where you're calling in from. So as I'm getting all things set up, like people already have this message when it comes in. Um, so you could probably do that with other software. Um, but then they start commenting. And I get on there and go, hey, what's up? It's Aaron. Uh, great to see you. If you're here for the webinar on how to grow your business and do X, Y, and Z, then you're in the right place. Just comment in the chat to the right and let me know you can hear me. And I just do that over and over for four or five minutes. Yeah. Just get them excited because yeah. some people get there late. While that's happening, I'm also sending a reminder text message to people who haven't joined the automation system, sending it to people to get more people on there. And then what I'll do is I'll ask them, I'll say, what are you most excited to learn today? Just put it in the chat. And so now these are the soft closes, right? Mm -hmm. I'm already getting them to 
put what they want to learn. And while they're doing that, I'll read some of them out. Um, but other people come in and they see what they're excited to learn. And then I'll say, who's here ready to get started to learn X, Y, and Z? And I'll just read out the title of the webinar. And everyone say, oh, me, me, me. And they start raising their hand. And um, that, besides the software, that's one of the most important uh, ways to start is with the energy, but also getting them saying they want to be there. Yeah. Because that gets them to start sticking. Yeah. And when they start engaging, mm -hmm. they feel more bought in yes. to a webinar versus leaving. So you use Webinar Jam. Mm -hmm. Now, what do you use for the marketing automation behind it? Yep. So I use, um, I use email marketing. We, have, uh, we use ActiveCampaign and the software that I built with PT Email Engine, which is um, my pre-baked emails that I put into ActiveCampaign for my clients. We use this system and set it up so I've got a welcome email sequence. So when someone goes to our landing page and they put in their name, phone number, email, they get an email from me right away that says, hey, thank you so much. You've registered for the webinar. Make sure you check for the unique webinar link that we've sent to you in a different email because i got to send that in a different email. But they've already also seen my thank you page. So they, they register, thank you page, it tells them what to do next, email, email tells them what's going to happen, and then we send them some email reminders um, before the webinar. Got it. After, and then there's after the webinar. If you, you want me to talk about that? Not yeah. yet. Okay. Not yet. So, so okay. and, and, and we use Active Campaign too. And so folks, mm -hmm. we're kind of, kind of piecing the puzzle together here for you. And so it's a landing page. And a landing page says, hey, I'm doing a webinar on this date at this time covering this topic, right? Yes. For this industry, whatever the industry might be or whatever mm -hmm. the solution to a problem that might mm -hmm. exist. Um, how, let's talk about the landing page for a moment. Are there any specific elements that you're like, these are must-haves on a landing page? Like for me, I know that social proof, that hey, you know, his past webinars have been kick-ass and so I'm gonna, I'm gonna watch every webinar that Bedros does. Uh, a timer, like ticking down. Are there any other elements, because you, you're doing webinars mm -hmm. way more than I am these days, yeah. um, that you're like, these are must-haves? For the timers, we, we don't use those on the, we use that on, I think we use it on the webinar, it hasn't made a big a difference. We use it for our events, yeah. right? Um, but the things I think are most important are a picture, generally a picture of me. I use a picture of me. Those have converted the best, but it's a very clear, um, I think the copy is most important, but it's a very clear understanding, not a lot of busyness. So there'll be a picture of me, but it's a black background. Yeah. You know, it's the one cut out. And it's really about um, what is it people want? It's the title, but it's, collect their name and phone number and email. The phone number allows me to send them a text reminder, which I think is really important. So mm -hmm. I would say you'll get less people joining, but now I can text you and say, hey, make sure you check out, go find the link right now and put it on your calendar. Hey, we're starting in five minutes and I can do those things. What we do is we have um, an image um, which converts better than the video. I used to do videos. The images right now convert better than video. So image of you with written copy. With written copy. It's a headline, a subheadline, a little bit about what you get, and click here to join us. Then below the fold, so when you have to scroll down, there'll be three points, and they almost aren't even the exact same things I'm teaching. It's just three things people would be interested in. Um, my Jake, my ads guy, has helped me write some of these and built these things. And it's great. And it's just like, I was like, oh, where'd you get that? He's like, it's just copy that works. So it's really all we're trying to do is sell the registration, not the webinar as much. And then at the bottom, um, it just has a little bit of other info. And I think the main take home is, is to test the different ones. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, let me, I'm going to stop you right yeah. there. Because, you know, sometimes <laughs> when you've done something long enough, like yeah. I get it, I've been doing this for 20 some odd years. I just want the audience to make sure they caught this. Your landing page, the page that you are buying Facebook traffic, Instagram mm -hmm. traffic, uh, wherever you're buying traffic from, maybe affiliates are sending traffic to uh, people who already have your future customers on an email list. You could literally bribe them to send you traffic yep. from social media, wherever. Um, that landing page is not selling the webinar. It is selling the registration. Yes. Just like we yes. say when you send out an email broadcast promoting your course or your coaching service, do not sell your course or your coaching service in that email. Sell the click. Right. Because the click, the link in that email is going to take them to a sales yes. page yes. that is designed to sell the product or yeah. service. So that, that in itself, if people just stopped listening right there and went to some whatever sales page they have 
and just started to sell the registration and not the product, yeah, gold, gold. Okay, so that's valuable stuff. And so now let's talk about this. So as you get them to register, the reminders, what are the sequence of reminders? We know that on, on the day of the event, they're mm -hmm. getting emails and texts several right. times because just because a thousand people registered for a webinar, does that mean you're, not, you're gonna have a thousand people on there? Right. And right. in fact, you kind of, you touched on this. You said, you should ask for the phone number because yes, you'll get less people registering, but you'll be able to follow up with them via text. Yep. And that is absolutely true because you can get more people to register if you ask for a name and email, but less people will end up on the webinar since you don't have that third or that second mechanism, phone number, to text and remind yeah. them. Yep, and it's also, if they're willing to give you their phone number, they're more than willing, they're, they're more than willing to take the next steps. Yeah. It's like a, it, it, it's like it weeds them out a little bit, it is. right? It, it's not exactly even the text it reminder, it's yeah. just like, are you willing to give me this? Yeah. And if they are, they move forward and we can get a much higher conversion rate because I know I got um, better prospects. Mm -hmm. um, and I, well, the interesting thing I was thinking about is when you click on my the registration button, then that's when the registration piece pops up. And for the Evergreen webinar, it's got a countdown timer on there. Like you can, the new one starts in 15 minutes. Um, but it has a, we, we, I'm trying to formulate the right words. But on the registration page, there's the date. On the live webinar, there's a date. But the Evergreen webinar, once you hit the click, then it has the option to, you can do it now or you can do it at the pre-scheduled time. Gotcha, so let's shift gears now yeah. and that's, that's a perfect segue because everything we've talked about up to this point really makes sense for a live webinar. Mm -hmm. You're saying evergreen webinar. If you all don't know what the term evergreen webinar means, it is a webinar that he already knows converts. He's done a live version of this, of this and it converts. And so you either use a, a pre-recorded -rec version of it or you might actually pre-record a specific version mm -hmm. of it to have it evergreen. So you could be sleeping, you could be traveling, you could be doing whatever. And as long as there's traffic coming to that mm -hmm. registration page, yep. they have this opportunity to opt in or register and watch this evergreen webinar anytime they want. Yes. Uh, yep. there's, there's dates and times available, but it's so convenient yeah. because one of those dates and times have got to match up to them. So it's how incredible. Do you, how do you... <laughs> how do you decipher when a webinar is ready to become evergreen. Yeah, I think... Because that's like the holy right. grail. Like that's, you're printing money on autopilot. Yes. Yeah. Oh, I made a sale today while I was working at your gym, dude. There you go. Yeah. Working out like, BK oh, Strength and you're making a sale. I'm like, look at that. Um, how do you know? I would say if you want to look at uh, like conversion rate, something at least 10% conversion rate. But I know there are different industries. Some people, 1% conversion rate is huge if they have a huge market. Mm -hmm. For me, um, you know, if I know I do a webinar and I get like 10, 12, 14% conversion rate from people who attend the webinar, um, that's a great one for me to evergreen. The only time in the last four years that I haven't taken the most recent live and put it on evergreen was, let's say, a month ago where I had some weird sound coming from my iPad and it messed it up and I haven't done that. Um, but you have to have a product that converts. You do the webinar and you know, okay, hey, I can make it convert better on my webinar than it converts on my sales page or if it converts better on the webinar than from a email campaign to sell your product, take that webinar and put it on Evergreen. And what you do is you take the replay and you put it on a landing page somewhere and you automatically drive traffic to that through other email automations. I've taken my live webinar promotional emails and put them into an automated sequence that just drives people to the Evergreen version mm -hmm. and people go there and then there's a little bit of complicated stuff that you do with the software to tag people. And then you follow up with them once they've attended. And the conversion rate on Evergreen is lower than live. That's why you don't want to take a somewhat converting live webinar and turn into Evergreen. Yeah, like you have to take like one of your highest converting lives yes. yep. because knowing that if this converts at 18% live, it's going to convert 13, 14 on a Evergreen. Yeah, like I've got one right now and it converted 14% live, but it's 4% evergreen. Mm. But when I break down the evergreen, the people that attended who think they're attending the live version of it, yeah. now it's converting at 11%. But if they are attending the replay version, it's converting at like 4%. Gotcha, so explain the difference for the audience. Okay, so one of the- Because they're both pre-recorded. Yes, they're both pre-recorded. So one of the options um, with the software I use is that people can att attend just in time. They could watch yesterday's replay 
where they can attend tonight's 8 p.m. scheduled webinar. And when they register, and I can manipulate that on the back end. I always have a like 8 p.m. tonight register webinar. And um, I've gone back and forth between the, hey, just in time or yesterday's replay. But the, when they attend just in time, where it starts in the next 10 minutes, or it, they go tonight, the conversion rate's higher because they feel like it's live because they see the replay of the chat going in on time. And okay. it's just the chat comes in, and sometimes people get a little angry. They're like, why aren't you answering my question? But I always say at the beginning of my webinars now, hey, if I don't get your question, I'm sorry. There's just a lot of people on here. I'm going to do the best I can. Right. And, um, but I can tell when I get notifications that someone's put chat messages in on the Evergreen webinar, it's generally that person has already purchased the course. Really? So it's really cool. It's great. And I think if there's anything else to share about that is that it's, Sounds complicated, but how can you make it really simple? The most simple way to do it is to take your webinar, put it, make it a YouTube video, and put that YouTube video on a landing page somewhere. Simple as and that. And with a button below to buy. Right. And that's it. Right. That's the most simple way to do it. Yep. Now, obviously, there's all the you know the, the different platforms that we use, at, like Webinar Jams, mm -hmm. and 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 you know, it, it might come from a ClickFunnels landing page to webinar jam to marketing automation yeah. could be from infusionsoft or what sorry what was the one you use we use active campaign active campaign uh Mara post there, there's many out there so don't get hung up on the thing get hung up on the metrics yeah. because if it's not converting already don't waste your time in making it evergreen or even doing a webinar with it until you can get the sales page to convert because think about this folks a sales page that's written sales page if it's not converting meaning you're spending a hundred dollars a day to send traffic to it from Facebook ads, YouTube ads, Google ads. If you're spending a, sending a hundred dollars of traffic to it and it's only making 50 bucks, it's not converting. You're not making your money back. You want to make at least your money back and ideally more. I say at least because sometimes it's okay to break even knowing that on the back end, we yeah. sell high end stuff like $18,000 masterminds. Right. So if you spend $10,000 a day to jam people into your course, and you make 10,000 a day from that course, but you're like, man, I just sold 100 people on my course every day. Well, the marketing automation behind the scenes could be making them offers to get on the phone with you mm -hmm. or your closer yep. to sell a mastermind program that's yep. you know, 15, 20, $30,000, whatever the price point is. So that's the only time you wanna break even, that breaking even is okay if you have a back-end sale opportunity. But if your copy's not converting, it's easy enough to go onto a website and change words and headlines and add testimonials and guarantees and drop the price and increase the price. But if you go and make this complex webinar and it doesn't convert, well, that was a lot of work you did yeah. and you have to go back to the drawing board. So have your written sales page convert. This is why Aaron started this off by saying, if you have a converting course or a product, then you can sell it on a webinar mm -hmm. and really breathe fire into it. Yeah. All right. So, so all that said, um, gee, you must be like very smart, have a high IQ, <laughs> and obviously did really great in school and blah, 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 and was just sought after by companies left and right. Is that true? Um, no. Okay. <laughs> I mean, I'm pretty smart, but not in the way that most people think. Right. Right. I barely uh, passed the SAT. Somehow I got to Duke University, but I was 1,200 to 1,600 people there. So, the, so yes, I, you, I say I went to a great school. But it was only because of my ability to solve problems was I able to get through, like, high school and yeah. college. Like, yeah. how do I solve problems? But one day... I was walking across campus with some friends, and this guy, Lex, goes, Aaron, did you take your resume to the resume drop? And I was like, what's a resume drop? I was like, I don't even know. They're like, well, these guys are already, like, applied to school and done all these things. Um, no, I tried to get a, I tried to get a job, um, a real job, and uh, they didn't invite me back. And they're like, we don't dress that formally here. Well, I had worn a suit to my yeah, first yeah. interview, and this yeah. was in California. And so the next interview, I wore a sweater. <laughs> And uh, Too casual. that didn't work. And I couldn't get a job just talking to like, people. Fuck. <laughs> I can't get a break here. A suit, I'm too formal. A sweatshirt, I'm too casual. Yeah, but it's, it's one of those things where I think the, what we think of as smart is just being able to memorize a bunch of stuff. Yeah. But what's really, I think, um, separates a lot of people like you and, and I'll say like me is our ability to see around the problem, not just through the problem. 
You know, like the Far Side commercial where it has yes. that kid, the school, or not the, the the cartoon, the School of the Gifted, and he's trying. It says, "Pull to open." And he's pushing. Yeah. And it's like, well, I can see all the five doors around the back of the building, yeah. but most people just see what's right in front of them. And yeah. I think that, yeah, like there was, I was a temp. Beatrice, I was a temp, and this woman walked me through the alphabet because I had to refile stuff. And she walked me through the alphabet. I was like, you know, I went, I went to high school. <laughs> you know? Yeah, I, I mean, know the alphabet. Oh, my gosh. But, I mean, you come with your own share of, like, learning disabilities, yes. right? Yes. So, yeah. so, and I say this because, you know, it's when people sit here and they go, you know, and we paired off, you know, the money that we're making. And, and by the way, if you all follow me, you've seen text messages that Aaron has sent me. It's just what I do is I smudge out the name of all my coaching yeah. clients and I post it up there. And you guys, you, you know who you are when you see your own text messages sent me. And I use that as testimonials and social proof to sell more of my coaching. But when you see those kind of numbers, I wonder if people, you know, listening to the Empire podcast are like, man, this, these people must be brilliant or whatever. Like, I've got ADD and OCD. You've got ADD and dyslexia. dyslexia. Yeah. Right? Uh, I think both of us, fair to say, we're both unemployable for the oh. most part. Like, I, I wouldn't want to employ me. Like, I would just be a bull in a china closet, you know? Um, no. And so you, you defined it so well that we see a problem, but we see ways around it all the different doors that are potentially unlocked or easier to unlock than the main one that I'm trying to go right. through. Right. Whereas I think conventional smarts, um, intelligence is you got to go through that door. Mm -hmm. I do. Yeah. yeah. Well, but I don't, don't have the key. Well, I guess I'm stuck. Mm -hmm. Like we're just kind of looking like, well, how can I, I got to get into the building. The option of staying outside right. doesn't exist. Um, what what about you makes you that way? What about us makes us that way? Have you figured? Have you done some like self work to figure that out? Yeah, I have, and I, you know, I don't, I don't know exactly what it is that, uh, other than the DNA that I got from my parents. And I mean, if I look at my, there's a lot of things about my mom that I'm like, I do the same, and, and yeah. my dad as well, and I, and even my brothers. So I'm like, wow, there's DNA, but there's also upbringing. So I was given the ability um, to have space and not pressured to like there was pressure to be a physician my dad's a physician mm. and i didn't i was like it's gonna take me four hours to do organic chemistry on the first night i was like there's no way i'm doing this but i think um one it's having the um ability to know okay i can make mistakes and it's my parents aren't gonna um, fault me for that like it's okay to make mistakes then it's also the ability to um just like, man, some days I'll end up on Mars, like thinking about something else. Yeah. And um, just embracing that has allowed me to um, make that more of my superpower. When I was in fifth grade, me and the other five kids in class who had learning disabilities were stuck in a, a white room with no windows and told, just study harder. You know, it's like, it didn't work. Yeah. You know, and I think it's just um, being okay with thinking differently and being okay with not wondering, did I say something that might have hurt that person's feelings? It's just saying, hey, I said something and it's on my mind and you know, someone's gonna pick it up and be like, holy shit, that helped me with my business. That whatever you said was you know, something they couldn't think of because um, other people, everyone thinks a little about things differently. Mm -hmm. But if we can share what we're doing, and that's what I said before, is the only reason I got into coaching was because I was just sharing what I was doing and sharing solutions to the problems that I had and other people were like, Wow, why didn't, couldn't I think of that before? I've had the same experience going, how did someone think of this? Yeah. Like, where'd that come from? And I just think it's okay to be different. And it, it is very okay to be different. That was mm -hmm. a, talk about a great way to close. And so uh, let's see if we can get our friends access to one of your high converting funnels. Is that okay? Yeah, absolutely. Um, guys, one of the best things. So till this day, I literally have hard drives, like external hard drives like one terabyte, I didn't even know what a terabyte was until I was like, <laughs> I need to buy hard drives. Like, I'm talking like you know, 10, 12, 13 years ago. I've got hard drives of screen flow of me going through different funnels of people. So I just turn on Camtasia or screen flow and record my screen as I go through funnels. And I'm talking like teacher parrot, how to talk funnel, uh, medical funnels, probably physical therapy funnels. You name the funnel I've gone through and I've saved on a hard drive because if you see the same ads over and over again, that's a pretty good sign that someone's either like obscenely rich and just spending money because they've got too much of it, mm -hmm. or maybe it's converting. Right. The, the product's converting, so go through 
and be willing to buy what they're selling or at least take a look at the pages as you say no thank you to the offers and record them so that you can have a swipe file. And that's called a swipe file, right? We know that. And so if somebody wanted to kind of funnel hack what you're doing so that they can replicate it, guys, please don't steal his exact stuff. That's called plagiarism. Uh, but everyone who sits here and that have a good site or a good piece of copy or whatever, I always kind of like to give access to that if you don't mind. Where can they go to find that? Yeah, you can go to AaronLabauer.com. And then from there, it'll have a link for events. And on this event, it'll have our webinars linked on there. And it's the one of the best ones is the webinar on launching a cash practice. There you that go. That would probably be the one I would send you to. Perfect. So AaronLabauer.com, they go to the links and they find the webinar where you teach how to launch a cash practice yep. business. Yep. And specifically, right. you could go to LabauerConsulting.com forward slash free webinar. But that's a mouthful. Bingo. <laughs> Bingo. Uh, and, we'll, and we'll link that in the, in the description as well. And that is awesome. All right. What, yeah. what should I have asked that I haven't or what did we leave out? Um, gosh, that's a great question. I think it's, it's really it's, what, is, what stops people from making forward progress in yeah. their business. I think that's the biggest question. I think we've probably experienced it the same, but maybe I'll say it differently and people will understand it. And I think for, for me and the people that I coach, the people that I coach are all grad students, or mostly grads. They've, they've spent their whole life going through school, and the focus was to get an A, to get 100% on the test. And 100% in business isn't work it. It's going to kill your business. 80% is good enough. I said that to someone one day, and I was like, 80% is good enough. Like, just get off the damn fence. I think your shirt says that. That's currently. what my shirt says. <laughs> yeah. And it's because. Um, because everyone's so focused on perfection. Yeah. Why haven't you, what's kept you from launching your business? Why well, haven't figured out, written my lead magnet yet? I haven't written the ebook. I don't know the title. I don't, it's like, who cares? Minimum viable product. If I have an employee, I want them to get better than a B. But if I'm the business owner, I want, um, I, I don't want an A. I just need, I just need that 80. Yeah. Just put it out there because it's, you know, speed, speed of implementation is something you've taught me. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's this, uh, this strive for perfection is, if we're an entrepreneur, it's just gonna kill us. It's gonna keep us down. We'll feel bad about ourselves, depressed. Like, why can't I get this done? Well, it is done. It's yeah. just not the way we've been trained Dude, to do it. I, I mean, you nailed it. And the truth is, when entrepreneurs lean on perfection, like I just haven't figured this out, it's really a way of procrastination, yeah. right? So there's like some underlying fear that you're maybe you don't want to get rejected if your sales page doesn't work or you don't want people to leave a bad review because they didn't like you in high school and they whatever. You have to get over all of that. Or I'm not it. good enough. Or I'm not good enough because right. whoever told you that once and it stuck with you, never mind the 20,000 times people said that you're an awesome human <laughs> being because we always <laughs> right. search out for the negative, right? Yes. Yeah, so that's, that's a great piece of advice to share. Yeah. Um, and, and social media platforms, where can folks find you on social media? Uh, best place is um, Instagram at Aaron LeBauer. There you go. Easy enough. Well, guys, um, listen, tons of great information for you here. Of course, not only on how to make a funnel, but how to move people through that funnel and deliver a great sales presentation through a webinar that then creates, you know, lifetime tribe members, customers, clients, etc. cetera. Uh, and if you like this episode, do us a favor and take a screenshot, share it on social media, tag Aaron LeBauer and myself. And of course, leave us a five-star review. And as always, don't forget to tell your mama.